Dion, I want to begin at the end of the saga. South Africans have, over the past couple of weeks, listened to a harrowing four-part podcast. We'll get to the story momentarily. But as you've come to the end of this journey, have you got what you wanted? It's been a terrific journey. Um, I have found a level of peace around the entire matter. Willem Breitenbach was systematically grooming and raping boys and young men across Cape Town. And he is no longer doing that. We know where he is. He's hiding behind his mother. Um, and and he's not going to bother any of us anymore. Um, and and that, that certainly has brought me a whole lot of peace. So you wanted four things. Justice, which you've just explained to me. You speak about activism, art, and revenge. Revenge I kind of get. Where's the activism and where's the art? So um, the revenge only came in later, to be honest. I, I didn't realize that that was one of my motives. Um, the descending order of importance for me has been justice, activism, and art. The activism is in the fact that Breitenbach has always been surrounded by these layers and layers of complicity, um, from his days at Grey College all the way through to Media 24, where he ruled the roost for 19 years. There's always been this set of people who's allowed him to, to do what he has because they want to avoid a scandal. So it's, it's only by exposing the layers of complicity and, and the ways that people get away with these kinds of things can we, can we actually start changing things from the inside. And I, I me and, me and Adrian Basuna are, are really hoping that this can be a, a kind of Me Too moment for corporate South Africa at least, and certainly for Media24. That's my next question. Is this our Harvey Weinstein or our Matt Lauer moment in South Africa, do you think? I hope so. Uh, I, I don't think we have spoken in South Africa about Me Too in the way that we should have. And I'm very cognizant of the fact that me talking about this is a product of privilege. Um, the fact that I could have made this podcast has been the product of privilege. I, um, other than being gay, I have won all of the other lotteries. I'm a white male. Um, I... I'm upper middle class, I have resources and connections. And it was, for me, almost impossible to do this, despite all of the resources, despite all of the connections. Um, almost impossible in what respect? Because the, the burden of proof is so high. Um, I mean, it's, it's, we didn't just start a podcast as a fishing expedition and went, oh, well, hopefully like other people will come out. There was I mean, a strategy. Well, yeah, and I mean, we had, a, we had more than a dozen accounts of sexual abuse at the hands of Willem Breitenbach before even the first episode came out. Um, so hang on, Dion Wigert. Why not then go straight to the police? Why the podcast? It's, it says something about our criminal justice system, doesn't it? That's quite a leading question, isn't it, Jeremy? Um, I didn't go to the police straight away because, you know, there's a tried and tested method, um, by which I'm not saying that I've found the coppers anything but excellent in this case. I, I didn't want to go into a charge, uh, into a police charge office in, in Seapoint and tell them, hi, I'm Dion, I was raped, and can somebody please take a statement? Um, I wanted to put together a narrative. I wanted to put together a case against this guy so that it's not, oh, Dion says this and Willem Breitenbach says that. It's all of us say this and Willem Breitenbach says that, and you can... But ostensibly, that's what most people would do. They would go to the police and make the statement. You chose to go in a different direction. I'm curious as to, as to why. Justice, activism, and art. Mm. Um, the, the art aspect, which I haven't touched on, is I, I, I wanted to take everything that has happened to me and turn it into a flower. I didn't ask to be raped, and I didn't ask for the, the consequences of the past two decades. But that doesn't mean that after it, all, after it is all done, I can't make something or try to make something beautiful out of it. I understand that this is not the tack that most people would have followed, but I wanted people to be having these conversations. And here I am talking to Jeremy Maggs, the nation's finest broadcaster. And we'll take that out of the interview. The I insist on keeping it in. <laughs> Where did you find the courage two decades on to do this? How deep? did you have to dig? People talk about courage a lot, um, and, and, and I, I do thank people for, for all the incredibly nice things that they are saying. Um, to me, it would have taken more courage not to do it. Um, I, I never felt to myself to be particularly courageous. I was terrified of what he is doing, 
in plain sight and will continue to do unless I speak up. I can do this. I can actually do this. I can actually do this in a different. I can actually do this in a different way. Why now? Why two decades on? My, my understanding is that it was prompted by the recent death of your father. Was 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 that the catalytic moment for you? Extremely much so. Yes. It has a huge impact on on your thoughts and your thinking because suddenly the, the person who raised you is gone, and then you start thinking back about all kinds of things that you haven't thought about in many years, and then. One thought leads to another thought, and then, in the end, you're suddenly going, "Wait, I was in the Kruger Park with my father and my family when I was in the trick, and I was talking on the phone to this guy, because I now remember very vividly talking on the phone. And now that I think about it, I remember that I was talking to Willem Breitenbach. Why haven't I thought of Willem Breitenbach in 22 years? Could it be because of the rape? Yes, maybe it's that. Wait a moment. What did I just say? Was there a rape? What rape? Um, and and the way that these people get away with it is they, through the six stages of sexual grooming, they create the manipulation and the illusion of agency and the illusion of consent. Um, and because at that, at the crucial moment, I didn't have the power to fight him off, you then get told and get taught that. That was your fault. You were the the agent of all of that, and you got yourself into that position. And therefore, it's this cause of incredible shame. And you put it away for as deep as you can, as far as you can, for as long as you can. And it's not like we can remember what we have forgotten until we remember it again. Is this the first time that you have spoken about it in the twenty odd years leading up to this podcast series? Had you spoken to others? Had you spoken to your family, to your no, father? No. I, why, why not? Because I, I couldn't talk about what I couldn't remember, and it's it's been, it's been one of the, one of the tricky bits about all of this. Is I would have loved to be able to talk to my father about all of this. But but his his death has been the catalyst for for understanding why I've always been the way I am and why I've always been afraid, why I've never been proud of anything I've done, um, why I've I've only been embarrassed and ashamed. There's nothing worse than an interview than skipping to the to the last question in the middle of an interview. But I'm going to do that because it does prompt the question as to, and it's such a cliche, but. And you know what's coming. Have you got the closure now that you wanted, or have you only just embarked on that journey? Life is not quite about neat character arcs, and and that's what what makes documentary storytelling a little bit different. But we all want the neat character arcs, though, don't we? Yes, you? and and with regards to Willem Breitenbach, I believe I have done what I wanted to do. I wanted to warn people before December. I wanted to warn them lawfully and legally and in a healthy way, um, and I believe that I have done that. And, and I believe if I didn't tackle it by way of this podcast, he would very much still be a free man. He would be spreading his wares on the beaches of Hattenbos all December long, and another. I wouldn't like to speculate how many men will have their lives destroyed by a bullfrog. So you see yourself as something of a warrior in this respect, do you? I see myself as a, as an activist in in this respect, um, and and now that I have caught Willem Breitenbach, I say caught, my, I've, I've I've managed to slay my own Jimmy, but but I discovered so many other Jimmys along the process, teachers who are still teaching in schools, teachers who are still living in residences. Um, I, I would ask somebody, oh, I'm, I'm doing an investigation into Willem Breitenbach, and they would say, oh, oh, uh, Willem didn't break me, Mr. Whoever did. So I've got all of this stuff, I've got all of this information now, I will be sharing it with the police, but I'm, I'm also wondering, maybe we can report about sexual crime or, or sexual offences. Are you surprised, uh, Dion Wigert, that this particular individual hasn't been arrested yet? I mean, it's not for lack of publicity that uh, South Africans are now unaware of this. Um, I, well, what are they telling you? 
I can obviously not speak on behalf of the police. The, the coppers that I've dealt with have been thoroughly incredible. Uh, they have their process to follow and they have their own legal requirements and burdens of proof to, to step over. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to tell the police how to do this. I, I've, I've been working with the police. And, I, I and to the best of your knowledge, the matter is under thorough and ongoing investigation. The matter is under thorough and ongoing investigation. One of the criticisms that's been leveled at your strategy is that this is simply a trial by media, that you have hounded a man with a sick mother into hiding. How do you respond to that? This whole notion of trial by media, what exactly is a trial by media? I mean, the... well, in many ways, we're conducting a trial right now by but having this thing, discussion, I mean, aren't we? When the Gupta emails came out, was that a trial by media? It, or was it investigation and exposing things? Um, Sure, it is. Uh, I mean, a trial by media can refer to anything where a set of extremely compelling facts are presented in order to ha enable the, the viewer or the listener to come to the logical conclusion. What I don't quite understand about this, this, this criticism about the way that I've, I've gone about it is what are these alternatives, these, these effective alternatives? To, to what I have done. What are these tried and tested methods to investigate historical sex crimes and current sex crimes? What, what, what other methods? The tried method? and tested method is going to the SAPS and laying a charge and letting them get on with the job, surely. Uh, that is it suggests to me that you have little faith in the ability of the SAPS to do this, which is why you embarked on this particular route. South Africa is a middle income country. We're a developing country. And South Africans are very quick to, to demand some kind of, you know, Western standards and all of our utilities. We don't have that much money. The, the cops struggle. The, the, the NPA struggle. Um, it's, it's, these things are a struggle. And, I'm, and, and just because the cops are not able to investigate something this exhaustively and spend a year exo uh, investigating one man, that doesn't mean that they are the only investigators in town. That doesn't mean that they are the only people who can get to answers. I want to talk a little bit about the methodology, so how you constructed the investigation, and maybe that could lead on to the emotional toll that it took on you as you went from center to center. But you're not a private investigator, you're an advertising copywriter, that's what, that's what you do. How did you construct the investigation? When I started thinking again about Willem Breitenbach, I decided to check him out online to see what he's doing these days and, and what he's up to. and. When I found him on Instagram, I realized he's up to what he's always been up to. And, and he's never faced any consequences for anything that I know that he has done. Via Instagram, I took a large stack of index cards um, because I'm, I'm a brutally disorganized person. Um, and I thought by having index cards, I can kind of keep up and, and record details of different men in his life and different boys in his life as I find it on different Facebook pages, on different Instagram posts. Somebody comments on something else which places a certain person at a certain place. So in that way, I started building up a timeline of, of Breitenbach's entire life. But because of the nature of sexual offences and because of, of the fact that it often takes you more than 20 years to even acknowledge what has happened to you, um, I found that the young guys were hard to talk to. So I focused on the older guys instead, men older than me, um, who've had more, t more time to process all of it. The interesting thing, though, after the podcast came out, I started getting calls from these young guys, and I've started being a big fan of millennials, because I, they've been getting a really, really bad press, but they are full of you know, confidence and notions of bodily integrity and agency, which I think are wonderful ideas. Before I get to that, let's let the, the emotional. You do not seem to be picking up the, on my millennial <laughs> praise. I'm deliberately not going there. <laughs> um, the emotional toll. I mean, as you got deeper and deeper into the story, um, you must have lain awake at night as those memories came flooding back in even greater detail. Um, and but the podcast has also been a way of dealing with that. So it's cathartic in many ways. It's been incredibly cathartic. That said, there is a lot of Willem Breitenbach in my head at the moment. Um, I. I mean, I've, I've been following the, the, the news coverage like I imagine Al-Qaeda would have followed 9-11. Um, I've heard so many stories of what he's done to so many boys that I, I would love to take a bit of a Willem Breitenbach break for the moment. But I, I, see, I see my therapist twice a week. Um, if you are a survivor of, of sexual abuse, 
therapy will help you to heal and help you to grow stronger. And, and if I didn't go to therapy with my psychologist twice a week, I, I would not have the, the semblance of sanity I have today. What are the unintended consequences of all of this as you have become a minor celebrity as a result of this? How does that sit with you? Um, I slightly object to both the words celebrity and minor. Um, <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say I've become a minor celebrity. I have become more known as an activist, mm. and, and that I'm exquisitely happy about because this is an issue that is incredibly important to me. And a month ago, very few people in South Africa were talking to Jeremy Maggs about their teenage male rapes. Um, and here I am talking to Jeremy Maggs and about my teenage male rapes. I mean, I've, 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 I've managed to do something in the public interest in a way that interests the public. And, and that's been extraordinary for me. You chose not to go into too much graphic detail in the podcast themselves. Because I think that is part of why people don't want to engage with these issues. And um, I mentioned the example of, Le of Leaving Neverland, um, where two men talk about their alleged rapes at the home of Michael Jackson. I mean, it is, it is unsettling and brilliant viewing. Um, but it's very graphic, and, and it makes it incredibly even harder to watch. Mm. Whereas nobody really knows all of the detail, or really wants to know or needs to know all of the details of what Breitenbach did to me. But the details of what, what that did, of, of, the, of the impact that that has had on me, it, it, it is so out of proportion, or so disproportionate to what seems like the offense. Um, because you might go, oh, Dion, I mean, if, if after this interview I fondled you under this table, I mean, it's not that bad a thing. But if you are a 15-year-old boy and you think that I fondled you because you did something to, to deserve it, that is a shame that you will carry with you. Which you still do? I don't think so, no. Um, I, and, and even in the three weeks of, in the, four, in the course of the four episodes of the podcast, I, I've become less anxious because I no longer feel complicit in keeping Breitenbach's secret. In that sense, it has, it has, it has brought me more peace than I, I would have imagined, and I, and I could have, in the past three weeks, my confidence levels have, have increased. I, I, um, it, it's extraordinary, actually, but I'm, I'm, I'm less scared than I was. If this inevitably comes to trial, um, you're prepared to take to the stand and outline in graphic detail of course. what happened. You will, you, will be, you will be fine with that. And it is, it is not as if my affidavit to the police isn't extremely graphic. It's not like I follow this softly, softly approach with the coppers. I mean, this is the stuff that happened and, and people will have to know. I look forward to the trial in, in many ways. Um, people know who he is now and, and, and what he is now, and I have no problem with, with saying that. But I don't have anything to say to him that I haven't said to him already. And we did briefly touch on the notion of revenge, and I wasn't, I wasn't comfortable to discover that revenge was one of my motivations. But Breitenbach always preached the power of new media. At, at national school newspaper courses, he would teach students and, and, and school kids, including me, to never stop thinking of new ways to tell stories. And I did want to give him a taste of his own medicine. I did want him to feel what his survivors felt when he assaulted them. And I did want to humiliate him in front of his peers because he humiliated me all of that time ago. And I've never in my life set out to ruin somebody's life. This has been the first time I've done that, and I'm okay with it. I want to reflect briefly on two people, if we can. Um, and again, you also, we don't want to give away the entire story, but uh, someone called Robert, and you dedicate the third episode, I think, to someone uh, called Ben. Correct. Who was Ben? So Ben is the second survivor of Breitenbach after myself that I found. Um, he was in Grey College in 1990. Um, I found his picture in a Grey College year, uh, yearbook or Grey College annual. Um, I, I drove down to Bloemfontein. I found all of these names. Or I found all of these pictures and yearbooks. And then I started, I started tracking down the men in those pictures. And Ben was was the first guy who got back to me and said, 
I've, I've got a story to tell. Um, and, and Ben is a, he's an extraordinary guy. And, and I've met so many extraordinary men through this process, so many, so many smart and sensitive men who are still struggling to deal with what happened to them 30 years ago. Same with Robert. But that's the same thing. I mean, um, Robert and I had, have been talking on and off for six months. And in the beginning, he said to me, oh, nothing happened to me. But yet he kept on talking to me in a very cryptic, strange way. Mm. So, so then you can't push people. You can't phone up and say, hi, I'm Dion and I was raped. How about you? Um, so you, you, these are people who have been deceived by men before. So, so you, you have to slowly but surely get people to trust you. And, and, it, and it, took, it took Robert six months before he told me what happened. Has Breitenbach reached out to you? No. Um, nothing that isn't in, in one of the episodes. He, he sent me a LinkedIn message or two, or sent me two LinkedIn messages when he heard that I was asking questions about him. But as far as I can establish, he's, he's had no idea of the scale of the investigation the, the day that it came out. Um, but, I mean, I, I, I don't have anything to say to Breitenbach, so I'm, I'm pleased that he hasn't reached out. And back to the, the four pillars, justice, activism, art and revenge, how do you feel towards him now as you've come to the end of this project? He was such a big and powerful figure and such a bogeyman in my head, and he's a, he's a large man and, and, and has occupied an oversize in, in my brain and the brains of, of the other boys and men. Who have been who have suffered under him because he's bombastic and a bully. But then the the podcast came out and he was entirely powerless and and just the the impotence with which he has has treated the whole situation. I mean he he couldn't do anything but flee to his mother's house and 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 he's now hiding behind an extremely ill woman in her early eighties because he decided to go there. He is, he is a, he's a former media executive. He was a media luminary in his time. And so he was sending out journalists everywhere. It's not like he, didn't, he doesn't know how journalists work. He knows they will go at this point in the scandal wherever he goes. So he goes to mothers because maybe people will feel sorry for him because they feel sorry for her. And I'm so sorry about what that woman is going through right now. But it is Willem's fault. And... Willem hasn't suffered any consequences or taken any responsibility for anything in his life. I, I don't expect this will be different, and I don't expect this will be the rapid start of it. Um, but, but I feel so different about him now. He's, he's such a powerless and insignificant little person. Um, he, he's so diminished in my head now that, that I'm almost astonished at how, how afraid I used to be of him.